Hello. It's so good to see you again. It's so good to be together again. I'm going to light our chalice to begin our second uh, virtual online worship service at Elliott Chapel. Here is a chalice that we're going to light together. If you have your own chalice or your own candle that you'd like to light along with me, I'd invite you to do so. We like this chalice to bring us all together as one community. We light this chalice from different homes at different times of the day, from people's couches, from our, from our chairs, our easy chairs, from all of the places that we are joining in worship today. We light this chalice to bring our spirits together and to be a blessing unto this world. It's the time in our service for the children's story, otherwise known as the time for all ages. And I missed doing this for you with last week. I, I certainly miss seeing your faces and watching you all come down and gather around for the story. But I'm excited to be able to share a book with you. This is a book that is on my bookshelf at home. And so I thought it might be a good, a good thing for us to read today. This is a book a lot of you might know already. It's called The Very Lonely Firefly by Eric Carle. Um, I like Eric Carle especially because he's a collage artist like me. So here's the book, Very Lonely Firefly. As the sun set, a little firefly was born. It stretched its wings and flew off into the darkening sky. It was a very lonely firefly. It flashed its light, searching for other fireflies. You can see them flying around. You can also see the lights in our chandelier. Bonus. The firefly saw a light and flew toward it. But it was not another firefly. It was a light bulb lighting up the night. And they're saying, you hear that noise? What is that? They can hear the firefly. The firefly saw a light and flew toward it, but it was not another firefly. It was a candle flickering in the night. See the firefly down there? Yeah. Firefly saw a light and flew toward it, but it was not another firefly. It was a flashlight shining in the night. Dad saying, quiet out there. The firefly saw a light and flew toward it, but it was not another firefly. It was a lantern glowing in the night. There's a brother and sister out looking. They see something. You ever gone out looking for fireflies? I like that. The fireflies saw several lights and flew toward them. But they were not other fireflies either. There was a dog. It's a scary looking dog. Grr. There was a cat. That's what they do. And an owl. Their eyes were all reflecting the lights. See the, the owl is flying up there and you can see the firefly. The firefly saw a light and flew toward it. But it was not another firefly. It was a car's headlights flooding the night. You see the whole family, they're out looking. They see something. They want to go see what it is. The firefly saw many lights and flew toward them. 
But they were not other fireflies. They were, right, fireworks, sparkling and glittering and shimmering in the night. The 4th of July. When all was quiet, the firefly flew through the night, flashing its light, looking and searching again. Then the very lonely firefly saw what it had been looking for. It was a group of fireflies all flashing their lights. And this is the cool part of the book. You can see the lights flashing all over with the fireflies. So, do you think he was lonely anymore after that? I don't think so. Now, I like the, this story for this week because I think it's the way a lot of us have been feeling. You know, we're in our houses, we're not going to school, um, you know, everybody's all in together and we miss seeing our friends. We miss seeing um, the people that we like to go visit and go to school with and all the different places that we, we have friends. And we miss seeing those little firefly lights of all of our friends. So what I thought we might do this week is we could do a kind of a craft together. Now, kids get to do crafts all the time at church. Adults very seldom. So here's the opportunity. I wanted us to be able to find a way to shine our light for one another. This is corny beer with me. So I made this little template. This is a, a chalice, a uh, flaming chalice. And we're going to make this available online. And what I'm asking you to do is color it. You could just color it in however you want. You can make it any color you want. Um, and you could do it with color crayons or markers or paint or anything like that. And, or you could take it like I did and you could take the, take the pieces, cut them out. And then I traced around them onto other pieces of paper, um, like this. I, this is sort of the way Eric Carl makes his, his drawings, his, his collages. He takes different pieces of paper like that. Um, it's fun to make the, the flame part shiny. You can see it kind of glowing like that. I just used plain old aluminum foil, not too hard to find. And for the bottom part, I just cut a picture out of a, a magazine. Now, let me, let me say one thing um, first. If you're gonna cut out of a magazine, you have to ask for permission first, right? You heard me say it, folks. But if you make a picture like this, I would hope that you would take a picture of it and share it with us somehow, or maybe send it, send it to, um, send it in the mail to the church. And we can see all of the little firefly lights that you have. Now, we sing our children out every single week at Elliot. I miss doing that too, little rituals. So children, I want you to imagine that you are listening to a whole room full of adults who care about you like we do. And I'm going to sing the song for you. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. From you I receive, to you I give, together we share, and from this we live. Stay safe, everybody, and keep the light on. I invite you now into a time of prayer and meditation. If you wish to, you may plant your feet flat on the floor, straighten your spine, close your eyes, and follow your breath. And hear these words by my colleague, the Reverend Joe Cherry. Today, our prayer is to understand that we cannot be and say everything. Today, our prayer is to remember that we are a light, a lamp in the night, to help people find their way. Today, our prayer is to remember that we are these things. We are a light to help people find their way. And we must remember that we cannot be their way. Today, may we remember 
that a steady lamp by which others may guide their own journey is a gift for the universe. Our prayer is that we might be steady and not deny our own humanity. Our prayer is that we not forget to take a break, that we not let our desire to be the steward of all that lamp brings, our desire, not let our desire keep us too long from our own journey. Spirit of life and love, gracious, gracious God, help us to share the burden, share the responsibility, share the honor with other people, and share the love. Let us now dwell there in silent reflection, meditation, and prayer. Into this shared silence, I invite you to speak the name or type the name of any you wish to hold up for the love and prayers of this gathered community. It may even be your own name. We want to pray for you. Amen. So this week, I've been thinking a lot about heroes. Now, generally, we have a certain way that we think about heroes, that they are rare, that they are singular, and in a lot of cases, that they have these superpowers. So it's a clear distinction that they are very different from you and me. Now, uh, I was thinking about this story. I was walking in Forest Park the other day. This was this was a while back. Robert and I were walking through Forest Park together. It was well, around dusk time, and we we saw these two guys, these young two young men, that were deep in conversation on a on the park bench, and they um, they were having a really avid conversation about something. And as we got closer and closer, we, we were trying to figure out what it was. And then one of them uh, broke off, turned to us and said, OK, help us decide this. And we were taken a little back a little bit, but, but OK. They said, so who is stronger, Superman or Captain America? Dead serious, totally serious question. Now, Robert and I really didn't have a whole lot to say about this. We, were, we didn't have a whole lot to offer that situation. But I was just amazed at how seriously these two young men took this topic. And, and that is how we think about our superheroes, as not even that there are only just a few people who are extraordinary like this and deserve to be called heroes. There really is like one, there is like the best that you have to determine. Now, if I were going to be thinking about a hero, a really easy uh, choice for me would be, well, William Greenleaf Elliott. William Greenleaf Elliott seemed to have the hero thing going on. Um, he was, as most of you know, I think, the, the founding minister who brought Unitarian Universalism or Unitarianism to St. Louis. And he founded what was called at that time the Church of the Messiah, which is the, the first Unitarian church of St. Louis is what we call it now. And then from that church came ours and we were named after him. Well, in 1849, it was a year, I will tell you. In 1849, St. Louis was part of a nationwide cholera epidemic. There was also um, a fire in the harbor that took place that took out half of the buildings downtown. Um, but the cholera epidemic is what he seemed to write about the most. His, his diaries had stories about illnesses, about visiting people, people's bedsides, just about every day. The cholera epidemic went from January through late summer of that year. You can believe it. 
And now we know, today we know that cholera was, is transmitted by contaminated water. It's not uh, transmitted to one another through touching someone or, or being close to them. But the thing was, Elliot didn't know that. And he went anyway, right? He had his own recurring health issues. He was sort of a sickly type in some ways. And he went anyway. He said at one point in one of his journals, he said that he felt that he was as at risk as the doctors and the nurses that were helping people. He said because he would hold the hand of people who were lying in bed for an hour and he would get close to hear what they were saying, so he would breathe their breath. And miraculously, he, didn't con he did not contract the disease. So I think about this, and of course, as a minister in St. Louis for Unitarian Universalists, I think, wow, would I have done that? And it's not a very helpful question. I think one of the, the more helpful things that I would ask is, you know, well, what did the people do? What did the people in his congregation do? History is written about a few famous, extraordinary people, but there had to be a whole lot of other people contributing something. You know, uh, whenever something really difficult is going on and people are upset, I try to train myself to ask not something like, you know, could I be one of those heroic people or what can I do to fix this? I try to ask myself, well, what do I have that I, I could contribute to this situation? And I would guess that the Church of the Messiah, that congregation, did a lot of things. They brought food to one another. They took care of each other's children. In some cases, they adopted children when somebody lost a parent or a parent was too ill. They nursed people. They were called upon to be very, very brave together. And so it is for us, I would say. It seems to me that we can look at heroes all around us. If you look, you can see them. People who are making their contributions to make things a very difficult situation, make them a little bit better. So this week, I would say, I've noticed a lot of it. I've noticed a lot of it. People helping other people cope with, with social distancing. So I'll lift up a few of them. Angie Boland, who's a, a member of this church, decided that she was gonna do a, a Zumba class on Zoom uh, for all of us in her class who, who miss it at the YMCA. And, you know, it was clunky and we bumbled around and the sound went out, um, but it cheered our hearts so much to see one another. My friend Amanda from my, my lung transplant support group on, online, she created uh, something I, I love the title of this, a lung transplant COVID-19 self-quarantine fun page. And you uh, are supposed to post fun things to the fun page to help your fellow lung travelers who are, are really struggling right now um, with the threat of this, this illness. I noticed Linda Cummings. Linda Cummings is a member of our church who she's helping to organize the Pastoral Care Associates, helping people come together to take care of one another. I noticed Christy Lee, who is buying groceries, just buying groceries for her mother-in-law, Pat, and Pat herself, who is doing what she can to keep her spirits up too. My heroes are not all adults. Kate Bachhorst, my friend Kate Bachhorst is a middle schooler at Elliott Chapel. And Kate sent out cards to me and to members of the board thanking us, thanking us for our leadership and helping uh, uh, do things at, for Elliott Chapel. I thought that was awesome. Kids can do so much. I think about Sydney Fuschkoronek, who is, uh, has offered to and is, is going to organize the youth to send cards to our elderly people who are shut in and, and maybe very lonely because no one can visit them. And I think about all of the people who are, are home. They can't go to their, their place of employment. They're staying home and they're keeping their children alive <laughs> and occupied. 
and clean and mostly clean and occupied and uh, during, during this difficult time, helping them the best they can to understand what's going on. One person in particular that I, I think about too is my niece. Um, she made a contribution to me anyway. Now you have to understand this, uh, my niece, um, Kristen has a, a lifelong heart condition. She's had several heart surgeries throughout her life. Um, and she is like me, she's immune suppressed. So she's in a high risk category. Now, uh, throughout the time that I've known her, I've rarely seen pictures of Chris uh, sitting still. She's snow skiing, she's water skiing, she's running a 5K. Um, she owns a travel business that she bought from my brother when he retired. And so you see pictures of her on, on the mountaintop and um, going all over the world. And yet she is living with this high risk herself. And, you know, her own, her own business, of course, is really suffering because of it. And she said to me, hey, you should listen to the daily podcasts on the New York Times website. The one with Governor Cuomo and Dr. Fabiano DeMarco. You see, because they, they say the things that they say are, are really very scary and um, very sad, actually. You should have a box of tissues handy. And I, my first response was, well, okay, so why should I want to do that? And it took me a while. It took me like a day or so. And I thought, you know what? She's right. She's right, because what we're re hearing now, what we're hearing now from places who have already been what we're looking at, Italy, um, Seattle, and New York, they have wisdom to share with us. They have truth that they need to impart to us. And we need to hear the truth. It's not going to be easy. It takes a lot of courage to hear the truth. But that's what I think we're called upon to do today, to have the courage to hear the truth and to tell it to ourselves and to each other. Uh, this came from reading another piece in the New York Times. This one was by historian John Barry, who is a, an expert on the 1918 uh, outbreak of influenza. And he said that the most important lesson, the most important lesson from that time we can take is to tell the truth, to tell the truth about what was happening. At that time, governance, government also downplayed the seriousness of the virus. They didn't want people to panic. They didn't want businesses to suffer because people were staying away. They also did, uh, didn't want people to talk about it because of the Great War that they were, in, they were participating in, and they didn't want to embolden their enemies. But it was so obvious to the people what was happening. They were watching people get sick left and right. They were watching people die. Things were terrible, but the health officials and the newspapers were saying over and again, over again, it's no big deal, no different from any other influenza. And they just couldn't buy it, so they stopped trusting authorities. Now this was kind of a new idea for them. We have, we have had breaks in our trust in authority for a long, many times since then, but at this point that was a pretty radical departure. And because they, they thought that they're, they're lying to us, we don't know what to believe, they also stopped trusting each other. And that was the biggest mistake that they could have made. Now, one place was different. Um, a lot of the societies or a lot of the cities were, um, people were not acting well towards each other. They weren't helping each other. They were hoarding things and things actually got kind of violent. But one place was different and that was San Francisco. So I would also count among my heroes the city of San Francisco, all of the people in 1918, especially the health officials, the mayor and the newspaper came together and put out a full page ad in all capital letters in the newspaper, wear a mask and save your life, it said. Now, they were wrong about how effective wearing a mask was going to be. 
But what happened from that was that they were honest and it got people to trust them. People were afraid. They did start to feel fear, but they also came together, said uh, John Barry. And when schools closed, he said, teachers volunteered to drive ambulances, to deliver food and to help other people. And it, it changed the whole way that the city related to each other. They were able to tell the truth and be brave. So this week, to me, it seems more important than ever that we hear the truth and we tell the truth to each other. We can't say that this is not going to come here and be pretty bad. It is. It is. But we can only face it if we're honest and we face it together. We're going to need that in order to stay motivated to do the things that we're being asked to do, to stay in our homes, to, uh, to, to uh, self-quarantine, to social distance, to flatten the curve. We do have a chance to slow the epidemic down so that hospitals are not, are not overly, um, overly full and in a bad situation where they, they literally cannot help people like they are in Italy. I would say that the most extraordinary thing that I heard in, in those two interviews was Andrew Cuomo saying that he thought everyone, Republicans, Democrats, and independents, didn't matter. Those differences didn't matter. Politics didn't matter. A governor is saying this, right? Politician. He's saying we have to be Americans and to save lives. And he said, he talked about the president. He said, no one has been a more vocal critic of the president than he has. No one, he said, no other governor has sued the president as, as much as he has. And yet he is on the phone with him. He said at least once a day now saying, you've got to help me on this. You've got to be a partner with me. Will you do it? And he is getting it. He's getting the help that he needs. I believe that he and other governors and other local officials have pushed the president to the point where he is facing the truth himself, to tell the truth, at least for right now. And I think that is a, a really important and brave thing to do. Heroic, in fact. Today, my hero is anybody who helps us to hear the truth, to keep us connected and to trust one another. We can be brave, I think. We can contribute what we have to offer and we can get through this. I think uh, of Eleanor Roosevelt who said, courage is as contagious as fear. Yes, I said contagion. Courage, courage is as contagious as fear. Let us be contagious in that way. We need one another. We need to find one another like fireflies in the night and help each other through this, this dark time. Now may the love which overcomes all differences, which puts to flight all fears, which heals all wounds, which reconciles all who are separated, be in us and among us now and always. Amen. Until next week, go in peace.